this is how I got out of me hating myself but beyond mm. any any reason and you know it's just if you want to try it you can and Julianus you reminded me when you said about choosing your soul path he once said to me and I use this a lot I say this a lot and I don't care how many times I repeat it because it's so true he said one of the things that frustrates us is why do you humans continually insist on walking in the desert instead of sitting in an oasis he said why is it mm. you choose to drag yourself thirsty hungry dry under a beating sun suffering on your path when if you chose something differently you could be sitting in an oasis by a sparkling pool eating and drinking as much as you want in complete comfort he said why do you always choose the hardest routes even though the hardest route sometimes can be the easier ones and what he meant by that was is sometimes we choose the easier path because we don't want to face perhaps leaving someone leaving a job moving home facing up to someone you know we choose the easy road which is actually the desert do you know what mm. i mean insight and awareness spiritual explorer soul intuitive emotional and spiritual mentor and award-winning author lorraine nylon Welcome explorers and thank you for being part of the adventure. Today our guest is Nikki Allen and she spent 18 years as a UK police officer ending her career as a detective and then followed her generational gift as a psychic medium and paranormal investigator and she's also the author of The Rise and Fall of Britain's Best Psychic Medium. So thank you for being on board. Hello my darling, thank you for having me. Oh, it's my so pleasure. exciting. Yeah. Did you always know that you were a psychic medium? If it's generational, you're obviously from a family that's yeah. Yeah, it wasn't really spoken about, to be honest with you. It was like, you know, just get on with it, to be honest with you. And when I was I've said to be honest hang on a minute, I've said to be honest with you too many times here now, haven't I? <laughs> As a detective, you to be would honest with you, I'm certainly not lying. No, when I was about four years old, I used to stand physically or astrally plane to the bottom of the stairs in my house and look up to the top of the stairs and there was this ebbing, flowing, big, white, misty door. And I later realised that was the entrance to heaven. But, you know, I kind of thought every kid could do it. And I used to see things and it used to come true. I used to see colours and light around people. And I honestly thought it was just something that everybody could do. Um, the thing that really nailed it was when I was nine years old, my dad died in a road accident and it was mm. horrific because I was literally daddy's girl. And yeah. two days after he passed, I was out walking the dog with my auntie just to get out of the house, you know, because it was obviously full of both sides of the family, completely devastated because he was only 38. And um, I suddenly saw him pull up in his car. And he basically said, it's okay, it's okay, Nick, I'm fine. And I'm like, whoa, hang on a minute. They've all just told me he's dead. What the <laughs> hell, you know? So I run back to the house screaming and crying and really upset. And, you know, I, I remember pounding at my mum saying, how dare you say daddy's dead? I've just seen him. And that's when my dad's dad, which was the strongest portal of mediums, they're like seventh sons of seventh sons, and he said, look, I need to talk with you, Nikki. You're a special girl. You know, daddy is in heaven, but you can see people in heaven and you can see angels. And he said, so don't worry. He said, the only thing you'll ever have to fear are the living. And it's so true. <laughs> and then, you know, I did have a lot of trauma, a lot of abuse, because my mum, unfortunately, ended up marrying someone that was very abusive. Yeah. And it kind of, you know, took a backseat. Um, this ability, if you like, or my psychic awareness. And I always wanted to be a police officer. So with the abusive situation at home, I spent most of my time on what's called the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, which is like a, a really good programme that Prince Philip, I don't know who runs it now, to be fair, now he's passed. But, but it was, it was you know, all different things that you would credit to. It's very good to get a job as well. So you could be doing things like learning outdoor pursuits. You could be doing literate, literacy. You could be doing beauty. Whatever the chosen subject you needed to dedicate yourself to, to get these certain attributes with the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. So if I wasn't doing that, I was out horse riding or I was really working hard to get my exams because... I just wanted to be a police officer and get the hell out of that house. 
Yeah, I'd yeah. always wanted to be one. Don't ask me why, because a lot of my family are like East End villains. <laughs> Nikki, what do you want to be a copper for? <laughs> and I literally, within months of um, going into the, I'm going to tell you something really embarrassing. Within months of me um, finishing school, I became a police cadet. I got into the police cadets. And if you kept above a certain percentage in exams and physical, you know, exertions and um, examinations, you ended up becoming a full-time police officer. However, when (laughs) when we used to go into the canteen at night, we used to smuggle like wine and beer in. Yes, you do. You know, we're teenagers. And I started saying things to people, you know, like, oh, you know, your granddad's here or your mum's here or, oh, you know, your mum's just taken a new job, whatever. And so it started becoming an unofficial psychic evening. And they go, <laughs> oh, yeah, Nikki's really good. Come on, let's go there and get some wine. And we used to do that. And so it started to kind of, you know, become more prominent the more that I got on in the police service. And by the time I was a detective working on major investigations, you can imagine what it was like. I was a bereavement trained officer um, and I looked after murder victim families. That was my main occupation as well as rape victims. The problem is with the murder victim families is a lot of the time I'd walk in and the murder victim would be standing there. Right. So that was really difficult because you're trying to be professional and you know I'd be interviewing people and seeing if they were guilty or not I could see straight away so you ha- I had to be really careful because I'm a very what's the best word some people say drama queen but I'm very passionate about what I do whether it's an injustice justice in my job I was very passionate about and I just wanted to scream you did it I see you you did it and um, you can't because obviously this has got to go to a court of law you know, so I'm like trying to keep my mouth shut, which is really hard for me. And, you know, these people were sitting there thinking, yeah, I'm going to get away with this. I'm like, no, you won't, because I'll find a way. And we used to find ways, whether it was just pretending yeah. an anonymous call came in or whatever it was. And so, you know, people would come to me, the CSI guys would come to me and say, can you pick up anything on this, you know, on this crime? And they did it. I don't know if you remember, we had a huge case here that set a precedent for... Um, security and maternity hospitals because we had a baby stolen from a hospital, baby Kylie, I think it was back in 2001 and they basically, the team came to me and said, look, we've got the blanket the baby was stolen from, you know, what can you pick up on about it? And I literally just wrote out this whole, I don't even remember doing half of what I wrote out and I said, the baby will be back at five to six, this is what she's wearing, this is a view from the window she's not far away and the woman that's got her has been here for mental health and headaches and has just lost her child in the last six months, a baby in the last six months. I said, she'll be back, though. And I couldn't believe I thought, oh, my God, you know, I'm saying this. And I saw all these nurses were watching and all the rest of it. And it was true. We did find her. The woman had been there for head trauma and unexplained head pain. She had lost her baby. The, the view really got me going. Do you know when your hairs go up? Because yeah, yeah. they said, Nikki, you've got to come to the house. You're not going to believe this. And the view was like these arched trees in this lane. And it was drawn to precision. I couldn't, well, I could believe it. But when you see it, it's like, wow, yeah. you know. And do you know what? They're so embarrassing, though, because about... <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to say this, but about three months later after that, I ended up having to go in for gynae stuff, and the same nurse was there. She's going, oh, oh hello, you're the psychic cop, aren't you? And I'm like, this is really not a good conversation to have right now. I'm just saying, <laughs> what readings have you done le- re- like recently? I'm like, oh, no, I don't think so, love. But, um, yeah, so it, it did help. It helped remarkably. I got motives for murders and things like that as a police officer. But it just... I ended up doing psychic evenings during the night. I'm a bit like Batman, you know, I had my psychic cape <laughs> on at night and then I was a police officer or detective during the day. And it, it kind of it kind of worked, you know, as long as it didn't get too intrusive on the police work. I think it would have kept you very grounded. Yeah, it's and yeah. to stay because this is I think this is what's given me so much credit over the years because you know, sometimes society, the modern day witch hunt, paints psychics and mediums as like the fluffy tree huggers that, you know, believe in everything and, you know, all the rest of it. 
Um, but I think I've got a bit of credit because obviously I was a police officer and I'm grounded. And, hmm. you know, I don't, I, I literally say it as it is. And that's how I've always worked. So when I, I literally got medically retired, um, which was horrific, and I had a big breakdown over it um, when I was 33, um, I literally tore a lot of ribs away from my spinal joint lifting a dead body up and it just got worse and worse and they had to let me go and it was devastating and I think the other thing that I suppose gives me a lot of credit as well is I've been through so much trauma myself as an old soul that you know I've got that empathic view of I've been there I don't understand you know how you feel but I can kind of get an idea because I've been there apart from being killed I think I've had everything else happen to me to be fair and I literally, when I got retired from the police service, my house became alive. It literally was, I had light bulbs dimming and then exploding, chandeliers swinging, voices in my room. And amazingly, the partner who I was with at the time, he was saying, I can hear those as well, Nikki. He said, I can hear people calling your name. He goes, what the hell is going on? And it was really freaking him out. And it was me because I, it had always been, you know, people talk about being protected and all this. You don't have to protect yourself from anything. As I say, apart from the living, your guides do that for you. Your guardian angels do that for you. Your loved ones in the spirit world do that for you automatically. And I'm thinking something's going wrong here. I had total strangers in my bedroom pacing up and down. Do you know like the ghost film with Patrick Swayze? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was like that. <laughs> And they were everywhere I went, whispers, talking. And then the worst thing was the baby crying. And it was that newborn screaming cry. Do you know what I mean? And it was, oh, my God, it was just doing my head in. And my partners at the time. And every time I went into a different room, it would go, it would move to another room. And it wouldn't stop day after day after day. And he was getting really angry with it because he's like, I can't get any sleep, Nick. This is just ridiculous. And then my friend um, phoned me up. Most of my friends didn't come for readings because I kind of knew them. And so she said, look, I'm going to see a medium. Can you come with me? I'm a bit scared. She said, yeah, no problem. And I turned up on the door and this medium, Aggie, her name is, oh my goodness. She opened the door and she said to me, the baby won't stop crying until you serve spirit. And I went, what? She goes, you know what I'm talking about? And she totally ignored my friend. I couldn't believe it. And I was like, wow, I was who'd so she glad my... uh? <laughs> I said, who'd she charge? If you're getting all the information and your right, friend's exactly. getting all the So I'm literally, so my friend, um, who's totally blown away, is like, would well, you want to do a reading with us? She goes, no, 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 I'll do you. But she goes, don't you go anywhere. I need to speak to you afterwards. Yeah. And then within about well, a week, I was in her development circle. And then within a month or so, six weeks, I did my first public demonstration in front of 100 people. Because she literally said, you're ready to go up. I said, oh, no, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> she goes, you're a natural performer. You're not going to worry about that. And she goes, you are you have got a direct line to the spirit world and the angel realm. She goes, you are going to go up and do it. It's as simple as that. And she was Irish and she would take nothing. She wouldn't take anything that you said against us. She'd be like, no, that's it. You're doing it and that's it. I'm like, oh, my God. So I stood in front of all these people. And the thing is, is that I've just come back from Florida doing this most magnificent conference. And they're all open and, yay, what have you got to give us in England? If you're new, and especially I was quite young for a medium, you know, and they're like that. I wonder if she's any good. <laughs> Is she going to bring me my mum? And it was a tough crowd. I'm not going to lie. There were some people there that looked like, you know, well, we'll see if she's any good. And the first couple of links were just, it was like tumbleweed in a cowboy film. It was just really, really, oh, my goodness. And then I said, please, come on, give someone give me something really good here. And this man who, it was a very, very tragic story, but you could not confuse it in any way shape or form his name was mark his best friend was rob he went to the royal oak pub on his motorbike said goodbye to his mate rob after having a drink and then he drove himself off a bridge 
So if someone didn't understand that, I was going to give up. And this woman just went, yeah, my husband's Rob. Yes, Mark and them used to drink at the Royal Pub. And yes, he drove off a bridge. I'm like, thank God for that. And so it started from there. And the rise of my career was just gobsmacking. It was just, vroom. I ended up doing paranormal investigations. My first documentary series, they asked me to do nine months after that. And I ended up doing Angels uh, with Gloria Hunniford. I don't know if you know her over there, but she's like a national treasure here. And everything just went bang. And, you know, it was like head swinging. I just, one minute I was, you know, just going out doing my readings. The next I was touring with Colin Fry, you know, and, and Derek Akora. And I, was, I just couldn't believe it. And I was, I got to the top of my industry very quickly. I wasn't... I wasn't the most happiest because I felt very much like I was a commodity. I will say that um, because mm. I've never worried about material gain, success. It's only if my view of being exposed to many people is to bring a set of message, to give yeah. a message to people. So I thought the TV programs weren't about look at me. It was great. I'm going to get more people that I can help and reach out to. That's how I viewed it. And then the second trauma of my life took place. And it was it was so simple and so quick. I actually saw it. When I woke up in the morning, I saw an impact in the car. And I said to my partner at the time, I said, we, there's going to be a road accident. He goes, where is it? When is it? And I said, I don't know. I just know I'm going to get hit. And he goes, well, it's nothing. it was horrible anyway. And uh, <laughs> she got it. <laughs> So I said, I don't know when it is. He said, well, we're supposed to be going to Devon today. And um, Devon is like, I, I used to live in Essex, which is near London. So you have to go kind of southwest. And Devon is a beautiful place in the south of England. People don't know. It's all coastal. Um, and then it leads into Cornwall, which has just got the most stunning beaches and coastland. And um, I started doing some work down here. I'd found this place when I was touring with Colin and I thought, I'm going to live there one day. And it was just, I thought, a fantasy. Anyway, we were coming down here to do some work and I said, look, let's pop and have something to eat before, you know, I go and see the person that was running this place I was going to be doing a workshop at. And as we turned into this, like, pub restaurant, this young girl, she'd only just passed her test and she smashed straight into me. And the paramedics had to get me out of the car. Incredibly, incredibly, though, because I, I was like kind of crushed up. I could see her coming towards me and it was exactly the same impact that my dad died right. of. So oh I'm thinking, God. oh, my, I'm going to go up to spirit world with my dad. My mum's now going to have to deal with because it broke her, you know, it broke her soul, mm. bless her. You know, my dad passing and then her daughter passing. That's all I can remember thinking. She was skidding towards me because I was in the passenger seat. And. I was absolutely smashed to pieces, but in a soft tissue way. They, they did scans, they did so many x-rays, and they said there's nothing broken because I couldn't move. I cannot even explain to you the agony I was in. It was suicidal agony. I begged to be put out because I was in so much pain. And the exhaustion, they they ended up, um, I was overnight in the hospital and they checked, no, everything's okay, off you pop, you know, go back to home. We were renting a place down here. And I slept for two days. And when I woke up, I couldn't bear sunlight. And when I tried to get off bed, I just fell on the floor. I couldn't walk. I couldn't understand what people were saying to me. I couldn't create thought or processes or speech. Um, I had to be lifted to the bathroom, to the toilet. I, I just literally was like a dead body with a consciousness going on. It just wouldn't work. And this is where I always say to people, when something happens to you that potentially is going to change your life, start learning to accept and surrender right there if you know that it's going to change your life rather than fight it. Because stupidly, and I look back, and funnily enough, darling, I was just looking at a photo yesterday. I was trying to find another photograph. And there's a photo of me at a show, doing a show with thumbs up, smiling on chairs that were stacked up because I wasn't strong enough to stand up. That's how mm. much self-love I had. 
that I refused to stop going to shows because I was worried that people wouldn't like me anymore or I'd be a failure. And so they'd be putting sofas and settees up on theatre stages so that I could do the shows. And I was forcing myself and I literally slept the whole time when I wasn't working. And then I would drag myself up, drink loads of Red Bull, take the most outrageous amount of painkillers to just go and do a show or go and do whatever I need to do and then go back to bed again. How long did that last for? Well, what happened, that that lasted for about a year. Right. And then my partner left me and stole £65,000 from me because he didn't want to be with someone that was going to be left in a wheelchair. I was diagnosed with ME, which is chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, eventually after a year of tests. And I did a show at Christmas time and I collapsed halfway through and my body literally was dying then and there. Rather stupidly, I finished the second half and I really shouldn't have because it was the most awful show ever as far as I was concerned. And then I realised enough's enough, you're going to have to stop. And that then led to me being in bed for five years. Wow. Wow. Five mm. years. I lost my home. I lost my holiday home, my career, my friends, my social status, my way of life. I literally had my two little rescue dogs. I had a load of dustbin bags. And I knew they were going to take my, my homes away. So I managed to try and, you know, I tried to get some furniture out and I had that in storage and that was it. And then I was homeless for eight months. And so I was laying on people's settees. And if you can imagine how ill I was, it was quite embarrassing because all I wanted to do was die. I was so tired. It, you know, I used to hear people with ME, you know, these people that had ME, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. And I used to think, get over it. You know, it's all in your mind. My goodness. It is one of the most debilitating, horrific diseases out there. And... It was the most horrific thing that ever happened to me, but also the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me. Because even though I was working as a very, you know, highly esteemed international medium and all the, you know, jangles and bells that came with it, I still hadn't healed myself within. So as far as I was concerned, I was still the person that deserved to be abused. I was still the person that was full of rage and self-hatred. And as long as I was a typical empath, really, as long as I was helping everybody else, then I was happy. But I was missing the trick that I wasn't looking after myself. I wasn't absorbing the spiritual messages I was giving to everybody else. I wasn't absorbing the love the angels could bring. I was pushing them on to everybody else. And my, did I get a wake-up call because... I ended up, this is, I'm giving you all the spoilers for for this book, (laughs) my first book, Me, Myself and I, or Me, Myself and I. Yeah, I'm going to jump in there, only only because when you've got people with trauma, like a start, you know, childhood trauma, historic trauma that they're carrying, people don't realise that 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 low self-esteem that they have, a lot of the time they really believe they're unlovable, completely unlovable. And what they do is they go, but I'm worthy of something if I'm doing for somebody else. Absolutely. And, and then what happens is they become very susceptible to being used and abused again in different ways, potentially, yes. not always the same way. And and they become abusive to themselves and they don't even realise they're doing that, you know, like, you know, pushing, you're, pushing, you're, pushing themselves because that's the only way totally they can feel right. a sense of worth. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and also you get into a pattern of familiarity so you feel more yeah. comfortable being in an abusive environment or relationship than you do with someone that is you know actually praising you nurturing you respecting you because that that's alien to you yeah you don't get that so we so you then have a tendency to bin those because that's out of your comfort zone you, you yeah. obviously think there's something not right there because you think well, why are you doing that I'm not worthy of that yeah. And, you know, I, I, I do worry sometimes when I'm so honest about this because I don't ever want anybody to think that I wasn't sincere and I completely, completely believed and pushed my love out to everybody during that time where I was at, you know, my highest in the industry. And 
I remember when I'd had the accident, amazingly, I I don't know how I had a bit of faith, but then it just dissipated after my holiday home went and I was homeless. And I remember standing on the doorstep of my friend's house. It was absolutely pouring down just to add to the drama. You know, I was all bedraggled. The dogs were crying. And I stood on the doorstep and said, I've got nothing. I have got nothing. And you know what? It was the best thing that ever happened to me. And this is what I try to show people now. Because incredibly, as I don't know how I managed to do this, but I ended up renting, and this is hilarious, this is hilarious, I used to go past this old Victorian lodge that used to be where the cemetery keeper used to live in a cemetery (laughs) in a place called Kingsway, right? And I used to drive past it when I was on a holiday down that way and say, I'm going to live in that house one day. It'd be perfect for me living with dead people. And we used to joke about it. Plus, I love old buildings. And my nan come from the spirit world one night and said, go on that right move thing. Now, right move is like, you know, state agent online thing. And I thought, why has she told me to do that? By this time, I'd had, I had so much anger and hatred for the spirit world. I'd convinced myself that they didn't exist. I lost my oh. faith because I thought, how dare they, after I've done everything for them, done all these messages and given my life to them, put me in this position. So I just thought, I used to I used to tell myself, I used to make it up, you're a good guesser. You're a cold reader, like the sceptics say. They, you're, you're nothing. So all the demons that had sat within were here now telling me, yeah, you get what you deserve. Yeah. That's why you're here. This is why this happened, da 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 And um, so anyway, I thought, well, my nan said about going on this app. So I went on this app and there was this cottage and it looked really sweet. And I thought, I can't afford it, but just to get me out for the day, I'll get my friend to just drive me to it. And it was almost like a fantasy of just pretending that I was going to get somewhere. And the closer we got to this address, I realised it was the lodge in the cemetery. I couldn't believe it. And I'm like, this is the Victorian house I've always joked about living in. So I said, I'm going to have it. She goes, Nikki, you haven't got any money. I said, I don't care. This is meant to be. And I've never felt so strongly about anything in all my life. Right. And I phoned up and said, um, yeah, I'd like this, please. I said, well, you know, you haven't been in it. I don't care. It's I'm meant to have this. And incredibly, the credit rating went through and I just lost everything. I was blackballed. I had no credit rating. It went through. There's no way it should have gone through. And it did. And then one of my old friends phoned me up and said, look, you know, if you need any money, I know you're good for it. I know you're going to bounce back you know, let me help you. And I went, oh, my God, it's funny you should say that. (laughs) And they just phoned out of the blue. And I said, I never, ever have asked anything of anybody. But if you could just lend me the first couple of months of the, you know, the deposit for, for, no, six months. No, no, I don't want that. No, you're having six months. And that's the end of it. And I'm like, before I knew it, I was in this Victorian house in a cemetery, the nearest grave was three foot away from the lounge and that was a grave from the 1600s and are cemeteries and had, busy places or are they quiet because they seem to be quiet. able to they're quiet very yeah quiet. I, I, I had no neighbors on a physical plane I had no neighbors there was a beautiful river that ran down to the sea um, I was surrounded by woodland in this really old um cemetery and I thought, I'm not going to lie to you, darling. I had the light on <laughs> for the first two weeks because there was, there, was no, there was no superficial lighting. It was completely dark as dark. I was in the middle of like a woodland. God knows what well, I know yeah. now why I did it. And not a thing. And I'd always stood by it. Who wants to remain where their yes. physical body's left? Yes. Nobody does. I, I always think family. cemeteries are the quietest place. Yeah, for that reason. Totally. They're, not, they're not there. They're not there. Of course they're not. And yeah. you know, they said, Oh, you know that the chapel in the middle of the field, you know, that's where people hung themselves and that was the old mortuary, and they're not gonna be here. I don't care. But I did, I did leave the light on. But then I realized, <laughs> uh, you know, and then I had my first visit from my guide, and the seraphim came in with him, the oldest order order of the archangels, and I and I thought I'm making it up. But luckily, my dogs reacted to every single celestial figure that visited me. So I knew it was real. 
So yeah, soon right. as something walked into the doorway, my dogs were like, rah, 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 and, I th- and they were looking right at it. So that really helped me to know that it was real. And to cut a very, very long story short, they took me through the biggest spiritual boot camp of my life. I was, I had nightmares of going through all the abuse again and then going through it, looking at it, understanding the reason why he was an abuser and all the spiritual elements of that, as well as the emotional elements, previous relationships where I'd been totally bereft of any self um, love, of any boundaries, narcissists, cheats, gamblers, you name it, I've been there. And we went all through that. And literally, they just eradicated everything that I'd held within me. And I remember being taken to a place where my friend was going to do some drum healing on me. And as she was doing it, I was aware that my main guy, Julianus, um, stood by me and he held my cheek and he said, my darling Nicola, he calls me Nicola, can't stand it. I say that in every interview, I can't stand it, being called Nicola. And um, he said, do you honestly think that we would have done this if we didn't need to? You were so far from your divine path because of your self-belief that we, we needed to bring you back. And he then showed me, and this is what I tell so many people to understand when they're off of their path, is that he showed me a big bramble forest. And he said, unfortunately, you're going to have to go back through the pain to get to where you should be. Because you've put yourself through all this pain, through free will, even though we tried to stop you, and now we need to get you back. And once you're back, he said, it'll be the most momentous, most beautiful, most amazing thing that'll ever happen to you. I'd also had my dad visit from the spirit world as well, where he physically sat with me for five minutes in full manifestation. It obviously was a crisis visitation because I literally wanted to kill myself every day because the pain didn't abate. I literally laid in bed day after day, month after month, year after year, completely unable to do anything whatsoever. And he come and said to me, yes, you will go through the worst crisis of your life. He goes, you're going to be very, very ill, Nicola, or Nikki. And he said, but you are going to come out the other end and you'll be by the sea by 2019. You would have met your soulmate by then. And he said, you'll be working on the most profoundest and deepest way you never imagined possible. It's going to be completely different. And he said, so hold on to that and know there is a happy ending to this. And he told me that back in 2014. Right. So I thought, lie me, I've got another five years of this. <laughs> and, you know, the prognosis, and this is the danger of what doctors give you, that they can really impact you because doctors give you titles and then you live by that title. And then you tell yourself every day that's what your title is. And their prognosis to me was, you're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life because you've been like for three years now in this state, we don't think you're ever going to improve or get well. And so the danger of that is you tell yourself that and you create your own placebo, if you like. You create this, well, this is who I am, rather than say, well, no, I'm not going to accept that. And they taught me how to do that. They taught me how to cosmic order, all different angels, guides. They taught me Archangel Raguel turned up, never heard of him in my life. And um, until I Googled him afterwards, because I thought I've never heard of that. It's a made up (laughs) name, you know. And he basically pushed me into phoning up all the banks and I alleviated myself in a day of £65,000 worth of debt. He helped me with that. And I was dragged kicking and screaming back to a reality that, made me who I am today which is free of demons and the best thing and lots of people tell you so they've been through a life-altering scenario like this have lost everything you realize that material world material gain means nothing love and health does you are grateful for the most amazingly tiny things waking up to birdsong being able to smell the roses the freshly cut grass being loved by your friends who stayed with you yeah, because you, you always out find there. out, don't yeah. you? You always find out who your friends are when mm. you go down. And yeah. 
my goodness, that was a big wake up call for me. I can tell you that because obviously you're at a stage of everybody knowing you and, you know, you've got this highly esteemed title of Nikki Allen, psychic medium, la, 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 la. And then suddenly, boof. And it's amazing how everybody drops you. The magazines drop me, the book people drop me, the publishers drop me who are just about to do the book. And suddenly I was just not worth, well, wasn't useful anymore to anybody. And then, you know, the friends that I thought were friends weren't. And I found myself being in the most lonely place ever. But it was the best place ever because I had no armour or no no title to hide behind. So I couldn't be Detective Morley anymore, which is my real name. I couldn't be Nikki Allen anymore, international superstar. I had to just be me, faced with me. And Cause it really... when people... Go yeah, well, well, when you when you've got trauma and it's suppressed, right? We think we're escaping it, like right? so. You go, you go, you spend a lot of effort running from what you can't run from. So, and you you're looking for things that are going to keep that separation, but you're trying to feel good about it too. But there's always that that sort of hollow feeling, and yes. when that crashes everything that's suppressed comes up and everyone that's experienced that always say I was surprised at how much was suppressed yes you know like and it kept and coming you, and it kept coming I call it the cracking you know like yes so, yeah and it's a I think it's a beautiful thing to have and you know this is so when you're on the other down. side not what not at the beginning you don't not in the middle but when oh, you start God, coming no. out the other side you go no oh, I'm glad that's that why <laughs> Exactly. Do you know all these like memes and these sayings, ride the storm and all the rest of it? It is true to a certain extent because, yeah. you know, people lost it in lockdown because they were suddenly faced with themselves. They couldn't yeah. divert, you know, their inner demons and their inner pain anymore. They had to be faced with it. And I honestly thought it would, you know, wake a lot of people up. I thought it really, but it didn't. It, people turned into mass crisis. And, and that was a big thing for me. And it is now that I like, I, I really tried desperately to address because I honestly thought I was down here just to prove the afterlife. I honestly thought that was what my, my job was down here, but it isn't now. That's part of it. I still enjoy doing the odd evening of mediumship for people on Zoom, but I can't tour anymore. You know, I can't physically go and do things like I used to because it's too exhausting. But I found ways to adapt and that's yeah. through talking to beautiful people like you, enablers that are spreading this beautiful message of love, compassion and spiritual education. And through my books and through my, my guided meditations, I've found ways to adapt to still reach people. And I honestly believe that this way is the more powerful way because in that lockdown during those pandemics or the pandemic, whatever you want to call it, people suddenly turn to online. And so we've had this massive transition that rather than people physically going to places now, they're connecting more online. So for me, it was a dream come true. So I'm like, yes, I don't have to go anywhere. I can, and I do, I sit in my PJs. If I'm too, you know, tired, no makeup goes on. I'm really totally real. And I love that about myself. And this is what I try and encourage other people to do. You wouldn't see me dead without makeup on before literally my accident. But now the transparency of who I am is take it or leave it. And, you know, yeah. of course, I'm still sensitive. I'm still very, you know, I get upset if someone says anything nasty or does anything. Of course, like anybody else, as an empath. But I, it's like, do you know, when I watched Avatar, you know, that's one of my favourite films ever, Avatar, and that bit, I see you. That yeah. always makes me cry and emotional. I see you. And, and I say to people, I see you. I see your soul. I don't see your hair done or your teeth teeth whitened or whatever I see you I see the soul and so now my work is more about holding the hand and also during a human crisis but also educating people on the fact that they really can be the captain of their own ship so many people feel that their life and their control has been taken away from them for whatever reason whether it's trauma or whether something's happened to them and i'm trying to give them back their empowerment i'm trying to show them they can connect back to soul so i'm trying to show them that religion 
society, peers, and everybody that tells them that it's only us weird mediums that can do this. Everybody can do it. Everybody can connect into their own power. Everybody can eradicate their shadow selves. And that doesn't mean you have to sit in front of a psychiatrist or a counsellor for a year. We can all do it. And this is what my path's about now. So my dad was totally right. <laughs> They're always right, the spirit people. And um, to just Got a see different view. They can see wider. You know what I mean? They can see wider. So what do you think humanity needs to acknowledge and understand for us to evolve? Compassion and love. Yeah. Simple. The thing that's created everything that's going on at the moment is down to tyranny, greed, fat cats, the wars, the leaders. Everything is literally going through a massive crisis at the moment. But what people don't realise is, is that it's all needing to happen to then lay the field bare for balance and peace to come back in. So lots of people refer to it as the grand reset or the new world order and all this kind of stuff. But I like to keep it simple. And all of this is going up in the air like I did during my transition. And then it's going to land properly because everything is so discordant. Now, the reason I say love and compassion is recently... My, they're so funny, my love there. I do love them. They've got a lovely <laughs> sense of humour because they said to me, we want you to start channeling um, what we say to you live. So literally press record on your YouTube channel and we will tell you what to say. I'm like, blimey. So I'm not going into trance or anything weird like that. You know, my head's not going to spin or anything like that. And so <laughs> rather than me go up and meditate and then tell people, they told me to do it literally, you know, in time, do it now. So I'm like, okay then. And incredibly, it's mostly one of the biggest hits that I've ever had on my YouTube channel because I've only just started growing it really. They brought up the Israel and Palestinian war. Right. And they said, this is what you need to tell people. And this is why I say about this love and compassion. They said, as I say, they, I think it was Julianus, I believe. I think it was Julianus, one my main guide. He said to me, what people don't realise is, is that by focusing on the evil that's taking place, by focusing on all of the outrage and the injustice, you are feeding in to the frenzied controllers and leaders by doing that. We at the moment are sending Seraphim down, and Seraphim, as I say, oldest hierarchy of the angels that they, they work in the celestial gardens and heal souls back to normality so that they can go to the reality layer and live a, a life of peace and um, they eradicate all of the pain that's happened and traumas that happen to the soul they also are responsible for coming down and taking mass souls up at one go so you know natural disasters they work with archangel ariel and they come down and gather all the souls up and they work on the frequency of song. And incredibly, the reason why I know this, everything I say, people read my books or watch me on YouTube, they'll know that I have to prove it all, just like I was as a detective. So right. when they tell me things, I go, oh, I think you better prove that one. I think you better. So when I said to the seraphim once, when I was up there, I said, are you real? And they said, as real as the song you heard when we held you during your times of troubles. And when I was, oh, I feel a bit emotional. <laughs> when I was a teenager, after my abuse, my physical sexual abuse, I used to hear choir, song, voice, female voices, and that I used to rock, and that, and I, and they used to send me to sleep or make me feel comforted. And that was a bolt that's like smacked me in the face. I thought, oh my god! And they went, we've been with you your whole time, Nicola. And I was like, wow, okay. Um, so they said, so you need to concentrate on the fact that we will eradicate all the memories because I know from dealing with murder victims now from the spirit side that we step out of our physical bodies when we receive horrific trauma. So okay. every single murder victim has shown themselves standing next to me going, oh, look what happened to my body. So it doesn't actually happen to you. So yes, you witness that, but by the time you've gone up, had your life review and your healing transition, it's a distant memory. So anybody that passes violently or horrifically or slowly, they're not in their bodies. I guarantee it. I guarantee yeah, it. Yeah, that should be comforting so, for a lot of people. I really, I really hope so, and it's in that book uh, all about that because it's really important. Obviously, murder victims 
that feel okay coming to me, suicide victims, violent deaths, because I know I've seen it all before and I can handle it. So yeah. there was a lot to be said for me being a police officer for that amount of time. It taught me humanity. It taught me how to handle seeing horror. But they never showed me the horror. They just stand next to me and go, oh, that wasn't very good, was it? <laughs> and I know that they, they've come out of their bodies because if I've got a heart attack or someone that had angina or Parkinson's, I can feel it. As soon as it's a murder victim, I know it's a murder victim because I can't feel a thing because they didn't. It's right, really weird, yeah. really weird. And so they said, make sure you tell people that, you know, they don't suffer. So I like, did that bit. And then they said, what people don't realise is, is we are all energy, light and sound. By you creating sound in a prayer, by saying, please send love to all of these victims, please send strength so that we can get all of this, all the bad people eradicated. Sending intention and love to places isn't wasted. That energy has to go somewhere and you are directing it to that place and time and frequency. Yeah. So they said, tell people the power of prayer and intent is, is so tangible and it will ripple across to where it's needed. And I never really thought that. I thought it was just a bit, oh, yeah, there's a nice prayer for wherever, you know, Ukraine, all the bad people um, and the bad places where it's happening. And they said, tell them to not focus on the atrocities, just focus on them sending love, comfort, just as the seraphim do, sending this beautiful song of, you know, tranquility, balance and calm and safety. Tell them to send that. And so the response to that video was overwhelming. I had thousands of emails. It was just incredible to say we didn't realise how powerful we can be as a person. I said, of course you are. You are spirit in a physical body and you can also, you can astrally plane. You can send your intent like my granddad used to do. You can send, you know, your energy anywhere you want. You can remote view. We've got, we've got obviously proof of that during the war times and all the spy different agencies that have used remote viewers. And, you know, people need to wake up to know that they have got some implementation in changing the yin and yang of the planet. And it's the same with sending it to abusers of animals, abusers of the planet, abusers of children. Send it to the victims, send it to the souls, not to that I hate them, because it's like you are, you are getting into their frequency then. So it's love and compassion. Send it Actually, where it's needed. I think that's needed. a key point, which is easy to, to override, is that when you're hating something, which is easy, it's easy to fall into, like, you know, yeah. don't, don't judge yourself. You're telling yourself something. But take take what you're telling yourself and then start moving forward. But when you're in there, you're actually joining the energy that caused you the trauma. You're yes. participating in it. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a hard one for people to get their head around, but it's an important one. It is because yeah. really when I first... I don't watch the news. It really upsets me too much. I, I would love to be just looking down. I don't mean that I, I, God, I don't want to leave this planet now. I'm doing all of this. But, you know, I just sometimes really hate the free will of some human beings on this planet. You know, some of the leaders and these um, terrorism groups and all the rest of it. And it really gets me and how they harm animals and defenseless children. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get so upset about it. I need to, you know, come away from it. And so it's tr you're absolutely right, because every thought leads to an emotion that then leads to a behaviour. So the whole it was such a simple thing that they told me mm. to tell the public is that if you start thinking of a soldier hurting a child, for instance, you start imagining and picturing what the child must have gone through, how horrible that soldier is. And you're actually creating a reality of pain, fear and everything else that's ugly that connects around that scene you're creating in your mind that then leads to emotion and behaviour. However, if you then change that to an angel holding the child in their arms and gently singing her back home to her parents and her ancestors, surely that's going to create more of a wave of love that's going to overwhelm the negativity that's taking place on the planet rather than, as you say, you know, investing into the horror yeah. And, the, and, and the violence and the unnecessary actions that some humans choose to take. And so yeah. I took a lot from that myself, that channeling, because 
that's what we need to do. And I never thought I'd be saying this in a million years because I literally, I call a spade a spade. And I'm yeah. very down to earth, as you can see. It's literally, I get on, yeah, this is your granddad. He's up in the spirit world. This is who he is, bang, done. But now suddenly they're, they're bringing in this consciousness. And it's like, I feel like I'm preaching sometimes to people. It's incredible. And they're doing it to everybody. Everybody who's open to this sort of energy, they're bringing in compassion, humility, hum you know, look after humanity, send out the love, send out the love. You are the love, send it out. And so I know that I could not have done that if I hadn't have gone through that five years of hell. I know yeah. that. And yeah, you know, that cosmic order, they, when they taught me to cosmic order, they said, you'll get your house. I'm like, of course I won't. I now sit in a mortgage-free house and the beach is about a minute away from me. Lovely. Behind me, there's lakelands and woodlands and fields. And I was homeless. And you yeah. just think, how did I get here? And I just say to people, the angels and the fact that I deserved it because I, I deserved to be where I needed to be to feel good and get well and heal myself. Yeah. And so, yep. and how do you get through it? And it's like, just open yourself up, surrender to the higher power, whatever it is you're comfortable with, and just say, come in, show me. And, and, and it is a process. I it is a process. You know, like, because you're talking through experience. So when, you, when you're on the other side, it sounds, you know, like because you understand it, you lived it. But when someone's actually going through it, that's overwhelming. So it's like yes. start one thing, one place. And I just want, I just want to flip back to the the hatred stuff. Is that by not hating something, if you if you feel a certain way, be honest about it, right? Even if it's hate, but if you keep thinking about it and you keep generating that hate, it's within you, and you're becoming what you despise. But yes. you're really becoming something that you haven't resolved. So if you give yourself permission to go, I acknowledge this feeling. And now I want to start resolving it because I don't want to be of that energy. And I I sort of sit very comfortably with the old prophecy that we come to a time where we choose our soul path and that we choose and what we're really choosing is the type of energy that we want to be of. And if you've yes. got more people being compassionate, intentionally compassionate, which doesn't mean a doormat, and by stop hating doesn't mean you condone. Yes. It's, it's not agreeing that this is okay. It's not justifying. It's not defending it. But if you decide that you don't want to be of it, you've got a game changer. And that's Absolutely how you right. got from homeless to where you are today because you decided exactly. I don't want to be of that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the decision, my decision at the time though, and this is what, you know, if I was now going back to perhaps year three of me being in bed and I was watching me being interviewed by you now, I'd be like, whatever. Oh yeah, you did really well, whatever. You know, I'd be, I'd be resentful. Yeah, I'd yeah, be yeah. hateful. And I think, oh, yeah. you don't know what you're talking about. Obviously you didn't suffer that bad. You know, obviously someone helped you and you're like, rah, 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 rah. I've been there, trust me, because I used to try and watch things yeah. to help me get that. Everyone so goes there. completely yeah. nailed it. If I could move the camera now, I'm, I'm not going to, because I almost end up blinking, dropping it, right? But literally behind me I've just literally had this created this space it's still not finished yet I've got stuff everywhere but literally just beyond the camera is a is literally about three piles of soul journals right I call them soul journals nice. and every and I was taught by them all none of this was me I can't say you know in my book I don't say oh yeah I smashed it I've worked it out I didn't work it out I surrendered to a higher power and said right okay then do you worse? Because I think you don't even <laughs> exist. So it wasn't like I was, oh, I yes, you. I'm here. I'm like, yeah. go on then. If it's so magical, show me how it's done. <laughs> and in those, one of the things they taught me is every single time I had anything that I felt could create a cancer within me, I wrote it out. I still do Brilliant. to this day. I yeah. my, my soul journals are my soul Bible. And I would, I, I cannot recommend it enough. Even if it's a notepad to a lovely thing for Christmas that you can write in, just get it out. Face, mm. get it on paper. Because 
when you have something within you, you've got so much ego going on, fear, self, doubt, whatever's going on. You've got your thought processes for your base chakra stuff that you're having to deal with on the earth, right? All the problems that come with that, people, job, work, kids, God knows what, bills, money. And the problem is it's all mixed like a kaleidoscope of chaos, you know, with the monkeys in your head also telling you, you can't do this, you can do that. So the power of writing it out and, and literally transferring whatever it is that eating away at you in that book is yeah. so powerful. And I never thought it would be. I've, I've done diaries since I was a kid. So perhaps, you know, I just intuitively knew that I had to get my thoughts and feelings out, especially during my abusive years. And they are my, I even, and do you know what the beauty of it is as well, is you can see how much you grow. Yes. Because when you go yes. back, and, and I literally, I don't hold any bars in that book, that book me myself and I there are so many f-words in there darling <laughs> I literally wanted to show people the vitriol the vociferousness the the hatred and the anger and the pain and the misery that I went through to say yeah I've been there I know what it's like and I certainly don't say oh I've done so well look at me I'm so clever listen listen to me I've got it all sussed I haven't yeah. but in that book and in my approach now, I can say, this is how I got out of me wanting to kill myself every day. This is how I got out of me hating myself Brilliant. beyond any, any reason. And, you know, it's just, if you want to try it, you can. And Julianus, you reminded me when you said about choosing your soul path. He once said to me, and I use this a lot, I say this a lot, and I don't care how many times I repeat it, because it's so true. He said, one of the things that frustrates us is why do you humans continually insist on walking in the desert instead of sitting in an oasis? He said, why is it mm. you choose to drag yourself thirsty, hungry, dry, under a beating sun, suffering on your path, when if you chose something differently, you could be sitting in an oasis by a sparkling pool, eating and drinking as much as you want in complete comfort? He said, why do you always choose the hardest routes, even though the hardest routes sometimes can be the easier ones? And what he meant by that was, is sometimes we choose the easier path because we don't want to face perhaps leaving someone, leaving a job, moving home, facing up to someone, you know? We choose the easy route, which is actually the desert. Do you know what mm. I mean? And he says, why, why, just, just why do people don't feel that they deserve to be in the shadowed you know, bountiful abundance of an oasis. He said, you need to ask people that when you speak with them, Nicola. Ask them why they choose to be in a desert. And I do it so many times now. You know, when I, I said, why do you it's want to be in the thing. desert? It's a good like, analogy. Yeah, well, because our first barriers to truth, like accepting truth, understanding truth and being of our own unique truth, is resistance, denial and avoidance to truth. And then we're codependent on the stuff that throws us in the desert. So, so I put it down to a soul immaturity. You know, we're a species that have a soul immaturity. So I think it's a brilliant time to do flip the book so that we can get some journal prompts for people. Flip the book. Flip the book. All right. So you've got three books to pick from. Would you like book one, two or three? Two, please. Two. Yes. <laughs> It's your insight and awareness book. I keep moving this book around, but it keeps on being the one that comes up. So oh, it's really? actually the biggest book I've got. So you've got one to 430 pages. 289. I could see the number, 289. Very cool. Oh, this is so exciting. This is great. One to, one to five. One to five. Pick a paragraph. Four. Four. Okay. So this is a really big paragraph. So we're going to we're going to keep breaking it down for you. So would you like the top of the paragraph, the middle of the paragraph or the bottom of the paragraph? Middle, please. Middle. You miss the opportunity to be present and honest about how you feel in your present moment and start telling yourself what to believe. You use your unresolved emotions to engulf your awareness of your insight of your sorry. I'm going to go back because I giggled at your response then. Sorry, you, you couldn't make it up, could you? No, you can't. No, it happens a oh lot. Oh, my it happens goodness. A lot. Sorry, go on. Sorry. Uh, and this is under the, the chapter heading, 
belief of not being good enough. So I'm going to oh, I'm going to start again. Smashed it! Thank you. <laughs> she likes it. Right. So we'll start again because we've we've got excited people. So you miss the opportunity to be present and honest about how you feel in your present moment, and start telling yourself what to believe. You use your unresolved emotions to engulf your awareness of your insight from your soul's consciousness as a way to diffuse any insight which is contradictory to your illusion of control. When you fight your soul's consciousness's ability to express truth, you inflict yourself with emotions which which are often generated by thoughts rather than events. You like that one? Can you, what have we just been talking about? Yeah. Emotion, thought processes lead to emotions, eventually will lead to behaviour if you don't nip it in the bud. Thought processes, relief, you know, it's like, sorry, not relief, belief versus reality. I believe that I'm rubbish. Is that a reality or is that your belief system? That's just incredible. A lot of time with my clients, what I say is your belief system's here and you've pushed reality away from yourself, but reality should be here and your belief system should be what you actually work out from your reality, not trying to get reality to suit your belief system, which is a really hard lesson to get. But once it you is, do, it is. Yeah. No, absolutely. It is very hard. But I that's part of what I do in the Soul Journal. And it just automatically came to me. That's I do it on my Prism Living course because everything they bought to me and what they created and what I was inspired to write and create, I put it in this course because literally I remember writing out, I am useless, um, nobody loves me, that's why I'm on my own. And then this voice said, is that a reality or do you believe that? And I thought, mm. well, it's both. No, it's not, Nicola. Mm. So I know it's no. one of them, so they call me Nicola again. And it's like, wow. And it is. And then you look at it and you think, right, hang on a minute, is that reality? And then it then takes you down another rabbit hole of, well, have you created that? Have you isolated? Have you told people to go away? Do you want that to be your reality? Or is it just your belief? And then you literally end up, and I could write up to 40 pages in a in a in one, you know, session. Yeah. You know, and so connecting back with the inner child or connecting back with the high voice, whatever whatever title you want to give that inner you, it's yeah. vital for everybody to do that. I, to I speak so agree. their truth. Yeah, I so agree. Because I, I, I have an online course for 70 essential keys for self-reflection because it doesn't matter oh. what you're doing if you can't self-reflect. So it shows you these different points and gets you in there so that when you are journaling, that you can actually go, oh, okay, here's a time now to do this. Okay, here's an hour. I'll yes. come through this filter instead of just coming through that belief or indoctrinated. You know, a lot of yeah. our beliefs have been given to us. Of course they um, have. Parents, peers, society, religion, churches. Experiences. You know? Yeah, what yeah. we take from an, you know, an abusive experience is leave you feeling insignificant, unworthy. And then that becomes a filter that builds your belief systems, yeah. Yep. And then you don't and like the belief system, so you suppress it. Yes. And then, and then away it goes. You know, oh, like, my God, I love you. I love you so much. You're so right. <laughs> because the, and, it, and it really is that simple. And the problem is, is people get so deep in their own pain that they yeah. lose that. And that's what people like you and I are here to do, is trying to bring them back into that non-judgmental state of have a look at yourself and work through what's going on. And it's really funny because you just, as you were talking about that, about the journaling and everything, um, my partner Darren, who, he was right there, met my soulmate. Again, you attract, you know, the right person to you when you love yourself. And so many people say, why can't I find the right man? I said, the same as me. I hate myself so much that I thought anybody would do you know, you'll do. And they thought the same for me. And I, and so mm. as soon as he sees me, if I go, if I pop into the bedroom early or everything's suddenly gone quiet, because I'm not a quiet person, as you've most probably worked out. And he sees me <laughs> with my angel that. cards <laughs> and my journal. He says, yeah. right, what's on your mind? <laughs> goes, what's going on? What have you got to sort out? And I'm going, oh, I'll tell you in a minute. Just let me do my thing. And then I, and he hears the sign. He goes, right, are you all sorted now? Has it all been leaving out? I go, yep, I'm fine now. That's it. <laughs> I'm not doing it because it's an act of self-love. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You've Isn't got it? it? It's an act yeah, of self-love. Is. What is yeah. hurting you? What is worrying you? What is on your mind? Come on, let's deal with this. Well, sometimes let's when you get it out. out, you know, and whether it's, 
Well, sometimes even if it's just a conversation with a friend or just sitting yes. quietly, you know, staring at clouds or something, but you're actually honestly communicating with yourself and yeah. and you will put stuff on the paper that you don't like, but then yeah. when you look at it, you can, you've got somewhere to go, okay, what do I want to do about that? What do, how, is that? Is that true or is it an illusion? So you've got, you, you've got somewhere to go, but when we just store it, and then yes. we try to avoid it. It doesn't go anywhere. You can't. Of course, it doesn't. It so. just manifest. It just manifests into this shadow self that then just eats away at you. And, th- yeah. and then the other beauty of journaling is that you can look back and see how far you've how far you've grown. So sometimes when yeah. I dip into my journal, especially during that time, I think, my goodness, was I really that person? Was I really there? Was I really thinking that stuff? Was I really creating that, what, this, you know, this self-misery, this self-affirmation that I was so useless? And now I look at it and I just don't recognise that person. It's and evolution. that's the beauty of like spiritual awakening and opening yourself up to your own love. Because yeah. without that, you've got nothing else. As far as I'm concerned, if you don't love yourself and you can't accept who you are yourself, then how are you possibly going to create anything around you that you possibly want to achieve in this human experience? It's not going to happen, yeah. is it? I don't no. I don't think so, unless you just well, literally... Even if it does, you taint it. Like even yes. if you get everything you want, if we go back in your in your history, you would have said, oh, yeah, this is everything I wanted, but you felt miserable. You're... You felt like a commodity. You know, yeah. like, so, so, so you weren't, you, you couldn't feel you, but now you feel you. So. Exactly. And yeah. I've never been so at peace with myself and I never thought I'd Beautiful. find that ever. And that's what people watching this, if they are in their crisis or the dark night of the soul, they will think I'm never going to get through this. It's never going to happen. It's never going to mm-hmm. happen. It really is. It's baby steps. And it's yeah. not, it, you know, sometimes I'm not, not disrespecting there are people out there that want to say try this and you know you'll get well and try this and do this but sometimes having to do things is too difficult for a person that's in severe depression or in crisis or in the dark night of their soul and even if it's just a tiny thing like do one nice thing for yourself that's it so you've got to do really I haven't got to fill any forms out I haven't got to write anything no just just try doing that And that's how they implemented my growth back to me loving myself. They did all that. I didn't do it. And then how about, how about what would you like to eat today? Have something that you really like. Doesn't matter if you're going to put on weight, who cares? Just, just have something that's nice for you. Yeah. And then, you know, perhaps try two things now. And it was a very gentle, beautiful process. I didn't feel I had to do anything. So it didn't become a chore to get well to get happy, to get this, you know, feeling of self-love that I have now, to get Mm. connected with that inner child. And that's all I want people to do. And to see people grow who email me and they're just doing tiny baby steps, oh, it it absolutely makes my day. And especially if they get a synchronicity or a sign from a loved one or from from the angel realm to go, I can't believe this happened. I had this number, (laughs) then I had it again, then I had it again. I'm like, yes. Because yeah. they're suddenly opening themselves up to the beauty of what the universe can bring. And that brings us strength to then send it out to the areas of darkness that Brilliant. are troubling our planet at the moment. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I want to thank you. So have I. Do you know what? Your energy is so beautiful. I feel like, I'm going to say it, you know, I don't hold anything back. I feel like I'm going to lay on your lap and you just stroke my hair and I tell you all my troubles. <laughs> you have the most beautiful empath. You really have got it all sorted. And I just, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honour. I know I did most of the talk and I always blink and do. But <laughs> thank you for allowing me to be in your space because it really is a beautiful space, I have to say. It yeah, really lovely. is. I really like you saying that. (laughs) Oh, good, because it's true.